you so much for showing up. It's a prime time of summer day, but I uh, uh, appreciate you joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure being here with you and um, uh, sharing the time with you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Betty, Rob, for having me <laughs> as a guest speaker. It's really lovely to uh, have this collaborative opportunity. Uh, Mortar therapy has been very precious to me. I love this approach. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not a big uh, proponent of what is your theoretical orientation because by the end of the day, what's, what does our uh, client uh, need is my priority. But um, uh, my inclination is Morita, of course, and I um, um, try to practice what he preaches. So it's my uh, delight being able to have an opportunity to share some of my treasure with you. So uh, I'm looking forward to hear what you think about. And uh, thanks for having me, Rob. Without further ado, uh, so today is about, uh, um, um, I prepared a material that introduces you the feel for monitor therapy. So um, I, I love to, I usually run a one day or two day seminar, more covering in full about principles and practice uh, aspects of it. But unfortunately we have an hour and a half, a uh, delightful hour and a half with you. So uh, I sort of uh, uh, decided to be selective in introducing concepts from Morita that you might be able to get a feel for what this theory and approach is about. Um, so Ishu, uh, who just retired, I guess, uh, is uh, my teacher. I learned more therapy uh, from him. And uh, uh, he's, he's always uh, tried his uh, best to have this therapy accessible, uh, welcoming to people who want to learn about this approach and inclusive. Uh, having said, more therapy, I think is very, very, one of the least accessible psychotherapy. I get a lot of questions. I want to be trained in Morita. Where can I get training? Where can I find a material? Many of the material, including original work, is written only in Japanese. So there's a linguistic barriers um, as opposed to, uh, uh, as long as there's uh, uh, in addition to some systemic barriers uh, of, uh, there's no seminars and workshop formats uh, that you can access to. So um, it's really regarded as really difficult to get a hands-on uh, uh, therapy. So uh, even in that sense, I'm, I'm delighted uh, that Rob invited me to share uh, the more therapy as well. So, and, uh, yeah, just more of an echoing. Uh, it's an honor being invited by you, Rob, and uh, uh, it's, um, I was looking forward to spending time with uh, uh, you all as well. Uh, that's my home temple of uh, Ikkyuji in Kyoto. It's the uh, middle of nowhere in the countryside, and uh, I love spending time there. Uh, I was there since I was zero, being carried by my mom, and uh, I just visited uh, there with my wife and son lately. And uh, I took a photo of my son sitting and meditating them. Uh, uh, he's four-year-old, but I sort of uh, forced him to sit. <laughs> can you close an eye so I can take a photo <laughs> into there? But uh, it, was, it was a special moment I wanted to share. Uh, of course, uh, land uh, acknowledgement, uh, where we have a privilege to work and uh, do our research and service on. I'd like to begin always with introducing to you some of the, uh, I guess, novel uh, oriental ideas uh, that you may be able to hang on to as you listen to some ideas uh, of Morita. Because this is cross-cultural counseling, uh, uh, we, we would like to celebrate and introduce to you some of the diverse ways of thinking things. So let me kick off with some of the, I, I guess, unique oriental thoughts uh, that are found, uh, that can be found in Morita therapy. So, can you hear me okay? Do I talk too fast? Yep, okay. So, uh, your first one, Kitaro Nishida. Who knows Nishida? Oh, he's a, a very uh, famous Japanese uh, existential philosopher. Um, he has a book out called Study of Good. And the good, that just doesn't mean uh, uh, axiological good and bad, or evil or holy. Uh, he, he, by good, he's referring to that seed in all one of us, all of us that has a potential to grow, to grow into something of good, something of uh, evil, something of something. 
so uh, he is probably the first philosopher that we have in Japan. He has this um, um, uh, key concept called pure experience, which is not too, too foreign to us. But let's hear what he has to say from his quote, quote uh, talking about this notion of pure experience. To experience means to know facts just as they are, to know in accordance with facts by completely relinquishing one's own fabrications by pure. I'm referring to the state of experience just as it is, without the least addition of deliberative discrimination. Again, it's not a foreign concept for us, for those of you who are uh, big on philosophy. Uh, in Mahayana Buddhism, we have this uh, idea of tathata. Uh, so that's the suchness. It's a reality as it is without least amount of fabrication. Immanuel Kant's uh, nomina, William James' uh, direct experience. So this speaks to the notion that there may be difference between facts and reality as it is and how people interpret. We talk about phenomenology, we talk about perception, uh, which we know in clinical work sometimes can be really distorted. If we look into schema therapy, uh, script theory, uh, if we look at the CBT, we're looking at cognitive distortion, etc., etc. So he seems to be referring to this gap between what is as it is and how people perceive it. And is, is there any pathological or suffering causing gap that we could entertain in the works of psychotherapy? So uh, the idea of pure experience is uh, a very common, and it's common in the uh, original Buddhism and Mahayana uh, Buddhism, and certainly in Zen as well. So this is Nishida's diagram saying that we think we are this, but he's saying, are we that? So we think the experience happened within us. But he's saying, no, we exist in experience, that we have experience. So we, we are part of existence. So it's very, uh, we're talking in a really general level, but it has lots of clinical implications. This one's one of my favorite, is uh, body-mind monism. And um, in object relations theory, they have this concept called self-object. Uh, there's no space in between, self-object. It's the state in which that yourself is not split yet from the object. So they combine the two terms to highlight that they are one. So I am applying that to this body-mind monism. So uh, there's a difference between dualism and monism and holism. And um, uh, anybody, any idea? What's the difference between monism and dualism? Your wild guesses. Something to do with two and one. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Great guess. Yes. Uh, the idea that the so in monism the mind is constituent, constituated, uh, and um, combined with the experience of the body. Mm -hmm. Whereas in dualism, the mind is transcendentally different from um, uh, the brain's firing. So yeah. Yeah. Great guesses. You could see that there's some clinical implication to it. You know, mindfulness meditation is very big nowadays. And uh, every time I go to Ikkyuji Temple, my Osho doesn't listen to me at all. <laughs> no, no talk allowed. He just said, just sit. <laughs> just sit. And when I scatter a sleeper in the entrance hall, he asks me to straighten up. And he tells me that if your sleepers scatter, you are scattered. So uh, it's a really interesting notion. And it has more clinical utility as well. If your mind feels scattered, it means that if you straighten your body or relaxing or have a nice hot tub or something, maybe you don't entertain hot tub. But uh, if you relax your body, according to this, you're automatically relaxing your mind at the same time. So monism, really handy way to think about it. We know in trauma literature, uh, is that trauma, trauma affect body. And in Zen, we don't make the distinction between mind and body. So uh, by taking care of the body, you're taking care of the mind at the same time into it. So we know the importance of uh, summer vacation. No offense for the summer course, but um, <laughs> there's a, a lots of uh, clinical utility and implication to it. One. And uh, uh, some of the apprentice asks, so if you straighten your mind, you straighten your body and your mind will go straight. And then Osho would say, the Grandmaster will say, well, those two are the one. So 
uh, Osho's masters, they typically avoid talking about componential talk. They don't use the term body, they don't, they don't use the term mind, but rather they use you. Something to think about. Uh, some of you may know 10 ox herding pictures. Anyone heard of 10 ox herding pictures? So I'm going to show you 10 photos and see if you could relate. So this is a, this series of photos will have a person, cow, and something else. And uh, uh, literally, this person is looking for ox. And think of ox metaphorically as a, let's say, cure or enlightenment. And so this is a, a this 10 photo articulates the gradual stages through which they reach enlightenment. Put it that way. So searching for the ox, searching for cure, they're searching for enlightenment. Seeing the traces or footstep of a cow, you're getting closer. Seeing the tail of the ox, catching the ox, herding the ox, coming home on ox's back. Now, when you get to that state, you're cool. You know, you're, you're looked after. You're, you're riding on a cow, you're going home. Once you get home and everything looked after, cow gets forgotten to that. And eventually, it all dissipates, an ox and a man, both forgotten into that. And we sort of articulate this photo uh, you've seen in maybe Japanese or Chinese temple about circle and gyozu. This uh, represents uh, the enlightenment, but it's not necessarily at this stage that you're reaching an enlightenment. As you can see, every other photo has a ring as well. So everything has, everything in this universe, I guess, occurs within your eye scope and perspective. That's my favorite one, which Morita therapy touches on. It's a returning to the origin. So whether you reach enlightenment or not, tree blooms, flower blooms, and river flows. So whatever what is, <laughs> nature just is. So it's, it's, a, it's a powerful metaphor, I find, reminding us about the grand scheme of things, of the nature which runs through us as well. And then the last one is more of a teaching for a uh, Buddhist monk to share the teaching of Buddha. So going out and meeting people and sharing life and sharing the teaching of it. Satori, the Enlightenment. Uh, Buddhism focuses on actually all 10 of them. Morita focuses on returning to the origin. Is this starting to give you a flavor of different thinking. Yeah. We have this Zen saying that willow is green, flower is red. So this is a Zen saying that uh, uh, willow, willow is green and uh, we have beautiful willow in um, UBC campus and flower is red metaphorically. No matter how hard willow tries, willow can't be red. No matter how hard flower tries, flower can't be green. So that's um, the implication of it, of taking what is as it is, and also fascination with what is as it is, and sometimes surrendering to what is as it is. So. I'm going to move on to fundamentals of Japanese Morita therapy here. I'm going to be introducing Morita therapeutic constructs. And uh, I'll start with the framework of uh, how to organize these constructs first. But any questions so far? Comments? All good? All right. How's the speed? Do I talk too fast or is it all good? Stop me, Masa, slow down. Uh, so I'm going to begin with Dr. Shoma Morita himself and his special treatment. Uh, he didn't name this therapy Morita therapy, like Masa therapy. Uh, it's a name given by his successor. He used to call his treatment my special treatment for Shinkeists. So we do have 100 years of history, just celebrated 100 years, founded around 1919. 
It's a treatment developed for Shinkeitsu trait. So it's kind of like a DBT. It's developed for the personality issue. And what the heck does that mean though, right? It's very difficult treating trait issue. Because how long did it take you to develop your personality? Forever, right? So it's very, very persistent, very pattern and habitual. We need some root cause change into that. So he grappled with that and this is developed for the treatment of Shinkeitsu trait, which I'm going to unpack in a minute. But uh, Morita openly declares he's uh, Shinkeitsu himself. Uh, I think I'm myself as well, functioning Shinkeitsu. Uh, in the West, we have this concept, Eisenk's concept, neuroticism. We have a high correlation between Shinkeitsu and neuroticism, which I'm going to unpack in a minute as well. But uh, that's, uh, he developed uh, uh, this uh, therapeutic approach uh, based on his experience and overcoming his fear. Uh, his fear of death that he developed uh, by visiting a temple, a Japanese temple, they usually have a photo of hell with uh, lots of orgas and uh, monsters and really gory and graphic uh, art work in there and he got really terrified and developed his fear of death. And uh, this treatment was developed out of his experience overcoming it. So he really lived what he preached. Please. Sorry if I missed it, but I know if it's, um, he's a doctor. Was it, like his training, was it in medicine? I'm wondering what the background yes. coming in. Okay. Yeah, his training is in medicine okay. and psychiatry. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So he, he has this uh, quote, which I like uh, to kick off. Uh, he says, treating an illness is so that the person can live life fully. Without the life to live, the illness has no meaning. And what we take out of this quote is that the scope of his treatment is a life. And uh, when we do some outcome studies or RCTs, we try to include some indicators that speaks about the quality of life. Uh, uh, not just the reduction in symptoms, if that makes sense. So outcome measures has to be custom designed and tailored for the particular type of treatment that you're testing. So monitor therapy, we try to include measure that measures more broad, how's this person doing in his or her or their life quality into it. So it's a big topic, but it has applicational range into it. So Morita's authentic principle, there are 18 of them. It's written at a very, very abstract level, at the principle level. So I am not going to cover the original authentic 18, which I usually teach in advanced uh, seminars. So today more about fundamental ideas. Taking from uh, this more digestible pieces of ideas, which I usually cover in introduction. But to know that he has 18 authentic principles, they're interrelated, it's very, very nuanced and uh, but powerful, but um, uh, we'll begin with more fundamental ideas. I'm a big fan of Joseph Rischlack, he's the philosophical and theoretical psychologist, which I adapt a lot of framework teaching assessment from September. Uh, and as well, so this, um, I, I like things to make sense. I don't like things scattered. It just helps me to, to my low functioning brain to organize uh, these things. So Rishlak came up with this uh, framework for the theory of personality, uh, person, personology. Uh, so uh, to put it simply, a uh, view of human nature, view of psychopathology, view of wellness and change. So this is in a simple term, this is, so when you're proposing a theory, this is how I think humans are consisting of. This is how they suffer, and this is how they maintain wellness, and this is how we can move from here to there, if that makes sense. So uh, courses like assessment, psychopathology, psychotherapy, it's quite handy. It gives us coherency into uh, our messy construct business. So I, I like using it. And I'm going to cover not all of them, but some to give you another a further flavor of Morita therapy. 
which I organized into rich uh component. So view of human nature, mechanism of psychopathology, view of wellness, and mechanisms of change. So that uh, we have some sampler view in a coherent manner. I'm going to send a, a slide to Doc Betty, and you can have a copy as well. If you're not connected to his lab or anything, just give me your email address, and I'm happy to share the slide in two. So uh, let's begin with a view of human nature. So this is the um, uh, section in which we talk about Morita's view of this is how human are consistent, cons consisting of. This is how human works. So theory of Shinkeitsu. So these are the characteristics of people who are who can be diagnosed as Shinkeitsu neurotype neuroticism, which is diagnostic category in Japan. Also the characteristics of Shinkeitsu type person. Maybe I could uh, inquire as well. Uh, perfectionistic self-expectations. Self Who has that? Me too. High achievement. Grad school, you <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's exactly what I'm trying to get at. High achievement motivation. Come on, grad student. High, high achievement motivation. Self-preoccupation. All the time, intellectualized, dogmatic worldviews and expectations, egocentric perceptions and reasoning, oh God, yes, hypochondrical <laughs> sensitivity and reactions to threats to death or threats to exam or something, high awareness of problematic symptoms. Oh my God, I have cancer. <laughs> Introversion. Welcome to the club. <laughs> Welcome. You can have all this functionally, right? You know, the diagnostic uh, DSM's functionality criteria. You can have anything you like, <laughs> as long as you function beautifully. Uh, Morita uses very archaic language, including his literature as well. But recently, we are finding, mostly with UK colleagues, that these are really transdiagnostic. How many of you have not heard transdiagnostic? approach. So it is an approach to try to find a common denominator. For example, uh, how many of you heard of rumination? It's a sticky thought. We know that that plays a role in etiology of depression and anxiety, especially treatment resistant depression and PTSD as well. So how many disorders are there in DSM? More than 230 or something. So theoretically you need 230 therapeutic approaches, but could we boil down to maybe 22 mechanisms that are common denominator and could we develop more targeted uh, approach? So that's a transdiagnostic endeavor. You know, for those of you who are in youth in care, youth are referred, referred to the service and they come with a five diagnostic labels. <laughs> so autism, ADHD, and you get lost in the labyrinth and saying, what kind of issues does he or she or they have? into it. So transdiagnostic is a language. This is research-based, more experimental, paradigmatic, uh, research-based, identifying factors contributory to one, two, or three or more diagnostic etiology. In the West, we have a Barlow's work, uh, you know, David Barlow, the uh, internal and exteroceptive etiological theory of panic disorder. David Barlow, very, very famous. So he has a unified protocol. So it is about finding that micro mechanisms responsible for multiple psychopathology. We're gonna cover that in assessment. But, um, uh, so when we use, if we borrow the language of transdiagnostic to, to read, monitor, vulnerability mechanisms, anxiety sensitivity, rumination, unhelpful schema. So Morita, 100 years ago, observed and identified some of these mechanisms uh, that he targeted. So it's uh, quite transdiagnostically designed. And Shinkeitsu has a high correlation with neuroticism. Behavioral avoidance. Any question? Good. 
Desire for Life is um, our um, signature principle, which we value so much. I seem to have this auto run, isn't it? Anyways. So Desire for Life, I'm going to introduce Desire for Life and Fear of Death. And remember the Shin Jin Ichinyo, the body-mind monism. And Morita thought that desire for life and fear of death are one. They are the same. They are identical. So just so you know that context before I uh, cover in depth. So he basically says every sentient, every human being has a desire to live. You have something that burns inside of you that gasoline or fuel that helps you to live. So it is a motivational construct and uh, according to his language it's what vitalizes all the natural. So uh, uh, my sensei will walk with me and stop under the cherry blossom light and look at me and tell me Masa, what enables this cherry blossom to bloom is running inside of us. So uh, we use lots of metaphor but it's the energy and uh, resources that potentiate you to be who you are. And um, my sensei, sensei used to tell him that, how do we, my sensei asks, how do you look for uh, desire for life? And his sensei said, uh, uh, look for what's moving your client. So s tell us something that, that moves them. Uh, for example, they need to get shopping done, because um, they need to cook a steak or something. <laughs> but it's a drive, hunger, a uh, 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 desire to eat well, or not steak um, sometimes <laughs> but uh, going vegetable maybe a dynamic and motivational because it gives people energy we have lots of psychological constructs that are playing for example cognitive distortion it sounds really dry <laughs> but a uh, motivation a love passion a desire it, it, it's burning and Buddha used to say everything is burning Right? So it's a metaphor because it gives energy. Uh, it's like a steam locomotive. Right? So it's really handy to have in clinical work if you're dealing with, uh, let's say, clients with uh, dysthymia or depression, uh, uh, anhedonic type of feature, uh, because uh, it's very important to get them to move. Um, so we're looking at energy, force, and motivation, bilateral in nature of the fear of death. So let's get to what I mean by that. So this is the diagram that I always use, that for people, let's say, who lived 80, 80 years, 8-0, eight right? So they, they lived 80 years, but it took them 80 years to die. So that's the perspective of the uh, desire and fear monism, is that your living is dying, if you think about it, isn't it, in perspective? Uh, it, not that I wish to think in this way, but the baby, when they're born, they're, let's say, destined to live 80 years. But at the same time, it's synonymous to it's taking the baby 80 years, 80 to zero years to die. So uh, in Buddhism and at least Morit therapy, we consider these two living and dying as identical. It's not different. It's the same. Um, all the uh, kind of mystical language on the side, Buddhism to me is the uh, articulation of facts. Sometimes it's really gory and realistic. We all die. But, uh, uh, but uh, uh, the, the spiritual teaching uh, uh, begins from there. So uh, looking at that, no one's free of dying and no one's free of living. But it's interesting point that Morita mentioned that many of people who are suffering from psychological distress, they're focused only on dying aspect, they're fixated on. Could we assist them to f look more about the living perspective? They're focused on the fear side of emotion, so fear of public speaking, anxiety, uh, which I'm going to unpack in a minute. But could we assist them, invite them to take a look at more desire, living side of the coin. And I know I'm, more, I'm talking more uh, abstractly, uh, but um, let me give you some example of the table we often use to give more concrete example of what I mean by desire and fear. 
So I usually hide this side. But, uh, fear of failure. What's the other side? It's a desire to succeed. succeed. So the primus goal is that if you don't have that desire, you won't have fear. So that's what Buddha says as well. Fear of rejection, desire to... How do you know? <laughs> desire to accept the inclusion. Anticipatory anxiety. Check in thousand times and talking to flight attendant before you go into the airplane. What is that desire for? Safety. Absolutely. Grief. It's an evidence that you loved someone. You bonded someone. It's impossible for you to experience grief to someone who you don't have anything. Sanjo passed away yesterday. It may not ring so much to you uh, because you might not know Sanjo is. So it's the uh, uh, evidence that you loved and cared for someone. Attachment is hard. Uh, guilt and shame, you can't have guilt and shame if you don't have conscience. Into that. Robert Hare, UBC, right? without conscience. Right? But sometimes in unfortunate cases, uh, the consciousness is so buried that we need to do some uh, therapeutic work, but guilt and shame, uh, the other side is conscience. Remember, those two are identical, right? Not one way or the other. They are the same into it. Sadness, desire for happiness. Despair is a desire for hope and meaning. So we try to cling on to this basic premise and try to find in our therapeutic dialogue what this patient may be or client may be holding as a desire. It's kind of hard, but a handy tool to have because clients always present problem, right? But if you push yourself, so what's behind her anxiety? What's behind her fear of death? Is that maybe she wants to live her life more differently? And what would you like to see happen in your life even tonight? So we could, we could get some clue about what moves them as well and motivates them. So we try to cling on to it and uh, we reinterpret with client. Sometimes we engage in exploration of what might be hidden behind the fear side of their emotion. And when we, the moment we succeed in doing that together, we typically see a lighting in client and say, yes, I want to be able to do well in public speaking. <laughs> I want to get a plus to get into grad school. But uh, we all can relate, but sometimes uh, for some reason we, are, uh, t we, are, we might be inclined to focus on so-called negative or fear side of it. So, any questions so far? Comments, thoughts? Um, would you be able to speak more to the, the, uh, the place of fear of death? someone presenting with some symptom of fear of death has implicitly a desire to have a better life for themselves. Mm. Mm. Is that fair to say? Yeah, that's what we are uh, hoping as in a therapeutic sense. Yeah, that's by the premise of the theory that we are looking for. Yeah, difficult work though. Sometimes uh, actively suicidal. But it gets really delicate of a work, what we can find in people dealing with that as a desire. Because sometimes some desire is really hidden or um, appear in a very different uh, way. But um, that's what we are up for, to discover together. You know, we often say, it's like, I would rather die than dot, dot, dot. And then we're already hearing the desire mm -hmm. to have that different and better life, possibly. But we cling on to it, we hope, and we can inquire and saying that might this be the case. You know, I've been noticing that you've been talking about this. I wonder if you're thinking about had my life been better? Would you describe to me what you wish for? Something, something like that you inquire to help them flesh out because they're so focused on I would rather be released of this pain. Something like that. But that's the work, right? That we do. Would there be any 
use or value for them exploring the other side? Or is mm. it like, when you're on this side, let's just focus on this. Don't, there's mm. no value in going into the fears. Wow, that's a great question. And um, uh, I really mean this. I always, um, at the beginning of a course, I always say there's different kind of questions. And what you asked could be a clinical question for me, which has no answer. <laughs> and, and, and the answer that you will make with your client, and, and so be it, right? And that's something that you grapple with. We have this beautiful luxury to use transparency, immediacy, observation, sharing, empathy, paraphrasing. So we could check with a client. If you're a brain surgeon, you can't do that, right? If you're looking at x-rays, this area seems dark. What, what do you think could be going on? But that we have a luxury to be able to work together with a client, and so be it. So clinical question, uh, so that is a clinical question. Uh, I'm copying out, but, <laughs> but uh, that's something that we grapple in the session. Okay. Yeah. Theory can suggest to you those two sides. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Empirical question, you can do research on it yeah. to see how that works, but uh, that's a great clinical question, yeah. All good? Making sense? Yeah. Yeah, just one thought. Okay. Please. Um, I'm just like seeing a lot of uh, sort of crossover almost between a lot of different theoretical orientations, especially around how emotions are perceived potentially as needs or, sing yeah. or signals, which yeah. is cool. I like that. It yeah. seems like it's really explaining more than just an existential frame as well as mm. a lot of the rest of it, which is nice to see. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I guess the, in answer to your question, it's starting to click, I think. Mm. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad, yeah. And um, I'm not surprised. And, uh, you know, theory, theories are not perfect, as you know, but uh, it catches something. And, and I, I could certainly see that some components overlap. Right? And hopefully they overlap all of them in right. a meaningful the way. <laughs> yeah. All right, so view of psychopathology and unwellness. So how the heck do people go wrong? <laughs> What's the suffering causing mechanisms? I'm going to introduce two of them to you today. Morita has extensive and exclusive theory about uh, many of the domains, attention, thoughts, emotion, that kind of things. But um, uh, that's an 18 principle. Today I'm going to introduce two major ones. But those two major one is organized under this term toraware. So it, to put it too simplistically, uh, our goal of Mori therapy is to assist client to move from the state of toraware to the state of arugamama, which I will talk about in a minute. So there are two principal characteristics of people who are in a state of toraware. So one is a shisono mujun, is contradiction between idea and facts. Remember Kitaro Nishida's pure experience is a gap between what is and what you think it is, what you perceive it is. So in CBT we look at cognitive distortions, similar idea. So it comes in uh, uh, two different types. One is your contradiction between idea and, and real in conception, uh, in your intellect, which is roughly equated as cognition. Another one is your judgmental attitude towards emotion and affect. You know, we talk about even in EFT, uh, first primary appraisal and secondary reappraisal. And people saying, no, I'm feeling anxious, and we ask, how do you feel about being anxious? And the secondary reappraisal is almost, almost all the time negative. <laughs> I hate it. That's why I'm here, to get rid of that into as well. So oh, you could see it's the, whereas they may have legitimate reason to feel that way. Of course, it's unpleasant, pleasant. That doesn't mean that it's also bad and good uh, emotions. But when you're in it, when you're in that emotion, it's very difficult to, to discern yourself. The second one is Seishin Kogosaya. Don't worry about the long English. I will do some uh, exercise uh, to help you get the flavor of it. So that's a, a mental interaction effect. Is a literal translation. 
which is heightening sensitivity via reciprocal precipitation between attention and stimuli. So uh, I'm going to demonstrate using some experiential activities. So one is to do with cognition, emotion, the other is to do with attention. So attentional intervention I find is rare. Uh, mindfulness, it touches on that. But rumination we know has two processes experimentally. One's cognition, the other's attention. We have this classic case that we give a homework for CBT and client doesn't come back doing it. <laughs> he says, oh yeah, let's, re let's take a review of homework. So I didn't do it. Why? Because they're still ruminating and they couldn't get to the work. It's because we address the thinking part thinking that they'll take care of it using thinking exercise but we're not touching on attentional piece uh, could we do something to do with attention uh, like could we get them to uh, things like behavioral activation they try to use more attentional strategies uh, get them to do exercise take a hot tub to take a mind off uh, we all have this experience we can't fall asleep because we kept on thinking about what's my test results from Dr. Betty's class something, you know. so so that's, uh, that's the attention being fixated. So if you try to do only a thought-based intervention, good luck. So we need to have more uh, cognitive attentional strategy, so to speak. Contradiction between idea and facts. This is my ideal idea. When in reality, I'm in a bunker. I don't find this distressing, but <laughs> this person might find it distressful that I can't perform the way I envision to be. And uh, I, I, now I'm joking, but when a client and patient are presenting this issue, they're really serious. And sometimes, and most of the time, they mean well. We have this uh, perfect mother syndrome, perfect father syndrome, uh, perfect professional syndrome we ourselves succumb to it sometimes uh, burnout uh, as well remember this is a treatment for shinkeitsu trait what's the first one the perfectionistic <laughs> tendency so those are um, uh, it it's limit is important balance is important uh, too so that's a contradiction between idea and real so I am going to do a demo of this, and I hope that the uh, thing will follow us. So, uh, so if I could do a maybe short demo, short exercise, and uh, if you could take one sticky and uh, put it on the nose, like so. And if I could ask you to maybe mingle around, stand up, chat with someone you have never met before, maybe say hello. My name is Yara Yara Yo, and uh, maybe ask maybe a weekend plan or big summer plan or something. Uh, welcome to stand up, mingle, chat with someone you've never met. Hello, my name is dot dot dot.
All right, one more minute, one more minute. Yeah, so. Everyone, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining this activity. Not that you had a ch chance, choice, choice to opt out, but uh, thank you so much. Please keep that on a little bit. But, uh, so that's the, uh, so, so let's move on. So this is an exercise courtesy of my sensei, Dr. Ishu Ishiyama. He would, um, usually do this exercise to introduce this idea. So uh, Monitor started to notice that the more you pay attention to something, the more it is amplified. So that's an um, attentional fixation. So if your attention is fixated on initial physiological sensation, let's say, it may be a muscle twitch, but if you focus more attention saying, oh, what if I'm having a heart attack? Mm -hmm. So if you pay more attention to, to it, and then it starts to get amplified. The less attention you pay, the more it identified that there's a peripheralizing property of consciousness. That if you're lost in the doing of things, and then attention flows freely to what needs to be attended to. It's, I'm, I'm talking very complex here. But the more you pay attention to, the more you get to see, the more of these, um, uh, let's say, symptoms being amplified. Is it making sense? Yeah. So oftentimes I can relate to this is uh, when you're going on an airplane, right? you hear the noise mm -hmm. and it may be a clunk on the flap closing or something. But if you start thinking about, oh, oh, oh what if? <laughs> Whereas if you order some GNT or something, mm -hmm. you, you flow around, something like that. So we could relate uh, initial physiological sensation into it. Um, yeah, it leads to aggravating. And what Morita noticed that oftentimes people do is that we try in vain to do something or to get rid of it. But the more you try to get rid of it, you're feeling more attention into your nose, into that. So that's what's mean by uh, self-amplification. Um, so hakarai is your subjective attempt. So it's, uh, it's an attempt to manipulate what is natural or factual. Many other patients with depressions or anxiety, they hate that feeling. And they try, they will it so that they don't <laughs> feel anxious or let's say stage fright or something. They, they put everything into it to try not to feel it. But what are they doing? They're feeling more attention to that. Uh, so that's an observation Morita made. Hakarai is the uh, symptom manipulation, trying to get rid of inconvenient, unpleasant feeling, fighting, controlling against such feeling resulting in Akujunkan, vicious cycle, exacerbation, and obsessive rumination. We could relate in a patient with a panic attack or social anxiety. They pay copious attention not to feel a panic outside, but they're kind of reminding themselves, don't, don't, don't feel panic. Don't feel panic. So it's in a way they're saying, feel the panic. Into. What was it like having the nose? 
it was easy that we were all going through it. I think. Ah, but, very true. Uh, yeah, power I, group. I found it yeah. a little bit easier. If it was just yeah. me, I think I would have maybe been touching it more. Very, very important observation. Now we can relate to client. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I am alone, Bob. I mean, the conversation was so grossy because we were talking about research, which is a dream for a professor, <laughs> that uh, I didn't even notice the, uh, the thing when you know for that. Well, there you go. Yeah, there you go. That's a dedicated professor. <laughs> Commitment. Yeah. And, uh, and your passion and desire. Absolutely. Finding a way that you could channel your desire that will, t that will look after your attentional fixation. That's what Morita is trying to go with. But, yeah. So changing the attention by doing. Uh, in yeah, there's a lot of that as well. Anyone who's... Oh, I, 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 I just want Please. Do they ever talk about like a line that could be crossed? Like, becomes like changing, or like, by doing something, you're kind of avoiding your issues that you yeah. might have or problems that you might... Yeah. Is there a line of, yeah. in, in Morita that you, you don't want to always just be like, oh... <laughs> yeah, great, great observation though. Thank you. There's a difference between ignoring and strategically paying, not paying attention to. So Morita tried to do strategically remaining inattentive to something. Okay. That is different from ignoring or dismissing. Gotcha. That, that's a very important point. Yeah, because th this whole therapy could be, ah, oh, just ignore. Yeah. That's part of the life. <laughs> C'est la vie, right? But, but that's, that's, that's not what it is. We use lots of empathy and desire for life. There's a clinical procedure that comes into it, but that's such important. Uh, point. Thank you for that. Because we, we all know the experience of being dismissed <laughs> as well. Yeah, very important, very critical into it. Yeah, it, uh, yeah I, I try to say, I, I always say no in explain this in 15 minutes, otherwise like tough luck, you know, <laughs> tough love uh, as well. But there's a lot more that goes into it, which is our therapeutic work, right? We always meet a client and patient where they are at as well, because it's really challenging. And they have a pace as well. So now we know the Seishin Kogo cycle, the vicious cycle of symptom aggravation, exacerbation through attentional fixations, at least in the nutshell. So shall we take off? Oh, yes. So uh, Morita's one of the solution mechanisms of change, and Morita advocates, uh, just like Rob was articulating, could we do something that potentiates your desire for life? And then they'll take care of that attentional piece eventually and hopefully. I always joke uh, about, so this is a, a goat. Uh, he is perceiving a threat because I'm taking a photo. Maybe he's thinking that I'm going to end his life and he's destined to be in my stomach. So he could remain, but he tries to escape and ended up being caught uh, further. So we use, um, this is a Zen story, but we use this photo to make a point that sometimes the very effort to try to change something, ended up exacerbating and making things worse. Uh, again, I, said, I mentioned Morita promoted uh, action to fulfill your desire as a way to deflect your attention to something more constructive. I always uh, say uh, Japan had an earthquake, uh, 311, tsunami came. When you're running away from tsunami, you have no time to ruminate. You have no time to flash back. You, you've, you've got to run away. So what, what is that teaches us? Is that sometimes when we can afford to pay attention to and to ruminate, we ruminate uh, into that as well. Uh, caregiver burnout and fatigue, we uh, uh, noticed literature. So it was only when they finished giving a care to your loved one who might have passed away or moved to institution, that you start to develop some symptoms yourself. Because now you have a time settlement. Right? Uh, literature and complex PTSD. Uh, it's not immediately after the event, uh, but it's much later.
the oneness. So what's the end state Morita envisioned then? So this is very difficult to communicate for us, but see if we could get a help from picture. So Morita promoted uh, everyone to take what is as it is. Aruga Mama. And uh, Aruga Mama is translated as what is as it is into. When you look at that bonsai tree, what do you see? Your idea. A bonsai tree that grew as it could in the directions that it did. Yeah, sure. Very tiny tree manipulated to grow in a certain way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. This in itself is like a projection test, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Experiences like that, isn't it? Like emotion comes out as a natural product, but we interpret in a certain way as well. But if you look at it in nature, we don't judge and say, well, there's some evil. <laughs> Anxiety is bad. It'll kill us. We don't, we, don't, we don't judge in that way in what is natural, but Morita construe that what is natural just is. And um, he didn't deny that it's unpleasant, but he never say that's evil or bad or not good. It's unpleasant. Whereas we have um, a society, sometimes we send a message and saying depressed is bad or anxiety is bad. Um, we, we have great high mental health literacy, uh, meaning that people have some knowledge about mental health issues, but um, uh, people who, who in places, of course culturally, that are really poor in mental health literacy they feel they're going crazy and they shouldn't be anxious, they shouldn't be depressed. So they place all sorts of <clears throat> uh, uh, judgment, stigma, sometimes comes from family, sometimes comes from themselves. Uh, and self-imposition is really hard. And again, when you look at the, uh, that's Mount Fuji. And uh, when I look at that, I, I think, oh, Fuji is beautiful. But that is also a judgment, right? That's beautiful. But it just is that angle. And we don't judge, oh, that's a bad angle. That's a good angle. It just is. So to take what is as it is. And I would like to make a note that Arugamama in Morita therapy is uh, quite distinct to acceptance. People sort of um, uh, inquire, oh, Masa, is it like acceptance? And the answer is no. Because um, it has a difference in nuance, yes and no, uh, in, in nuance. There are certain things in life that you can't accept, but you have to take it as well. For example, 311 earthquake, a lot of people lost their life. They can never, as a clinician, we wouldn't dare say, let's use mindfulness so that you can accept it. Right? Let's use CBT strategy to help you feel good about accepting it. So that's, that's almost unethical. But Aruga Mama is to assist and support them to look at what is. And then what will be born is left up to the person. So that's very different. Because acceptance, as long as it shall be a purpose of intervention, again, it's um, confabulation, it's a fabrication that we try to aim for it. Is affirmation more accurate? Word? It's part of it, yeah. It, it, you affirm or you assist them to even look at it, take a look. Affirmation, I guess you could put in that gradation, no way, and I could see that some of my clients move from absolute denial to acceptance. So it is in a spectrum, but um, it's not equal. And we could see the clinical benefit of not making that as the same because we can deal and meet the client who hasn't <laughs> accepted yet. But we could use empathy, we could use paraphrasing, we could use summarizing, help them to meet and face where they're at uh, as well. I was wondering, the first thing to mind was like making peace with them. Could that be 
Mm, mm. Yeah, I think it's part of the spectrum, but more towards um, that you have reconciled. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. I mean, we have we have this term, right? Like, uh, how would you like to come to terms with this? Right. I would. I wouldn't dare ask that. Mm. <laughs> that's something for them to arrive on their own, right? Gotcha. Yeah. But um, yeah. So that's what I have as a problem with things like ACT, acceptance and commitment therapy, mindfulness. If it's used as a pure gadget to help them accept because clients will say, if not giving you a finger, but <laughs> and say, let, let me just be where I'm at. And that's, that's okay. That's all right. Well, that's the state Morita aimed is Arugamama. What is as it is? Obedience to nature. Ah. Uh, weather for the next uh, two weeks. We're in trouble. Anyone has an uh, air con? No, that's gone. Well, we gotta obey the nature. I guess you can't yell at the heat, or you can. But um, yeah, we try to um, try to align in accordance with what is natural into that. We don't yell at the rain just because we hate the rain. Uh, and Mori therapy, we take emotion as affective capabilities. It tells you something. It's the other side of desire as we looked at. So even if it's unpleasant uh, one, so we don't judge what we take. That doesn't mean that you should love it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I hate summer. Heat. I come from Kyoto, constantly 38 degrees Celsius, humidity 100. So yeah, I've, I've had enough summer. I've had enough sun in there. But again, Morita's idea of nature is uh, not just a nature as outside nature, but something inevitable. If you roll a dice, it will give you some sort of number, right? Unless it lands on an awkward angle. But uh, those are inevitable consequences of something. And um, human feeling, uh, we capture that as an inevitable consequence. It's more natural consequence. In a way, you should feel that way. Either that is biochemical or something social. There's a reason and cause to it. So obedience is a strong word about being in accord with something that is inevitable into it. How do we support clients to digest that idea? That's a clinical question as well that we grapple with dialogically. Mechanism of change. Does that sort of give you a flavor of what we are aiming at to client create? Mechanisms of change. So we focus on action just because we think this emotional exercise or cognitive exercise goes against what is natural. So we, uh, Morita therapists, try to encourage purposeful action. And let me unpack what that means. It's a choice of action, but not the choice of emotion. I mean, you, you can try, but can you choose to be super, super happy right now? It's very difficult to emote uh, in that way. So uh, Morita made that observation and saying emotions and symptoms just are and we'll take it Arugamama and think about what can be done, things one can do instead of things one cannot control, which is emotion and uh, uh, my sensei issue uh, always promote anxious action taking. I have, this, um, I have this word, I am functional neurotic. You could be a functional perfectionist. You can have whatever you like as long as you're functioning. So, yeah. Uh, so that's the importance of action. And there's more to it. If you engage in action, you can change circumstance that surrounds you into it. Uh, my wife doesn't believe, but I am shy and nobody believes. Not about that, I try to take action with a shyness. And uh, yeah, my partner says, mm, I know you. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
But uh, uh, if we are able to support client to take small step, might that bring a different circumstance? Might that bring them a different experience in which they could taste something different? And then can we build on that? We do that all the time in you know, behavioral experiment, uh, exposure type of uh, work. And we value experience. Uh, Morita calls it taitoku. It's literally translated as bodily gain. You gain through your body. And you uh, uh, measure that. Taitoku and Nikai. Experiential embodied understanding. So he, Morita distinguishes the difference between experiential and embodied gain and intellectual understanding. I cannot know how something tastes until after I have eaten it. So I have this uh, uh, last exercise I brought. I brought chocolate. I can tell you all about. You don't need to. You don't need to eat it if you have a dietary restriction. I can describe intellectually about what this tastes like, but nothing beats tasting it as well. So if you could take one and imagine, maybe we'll eat it together. Imagine what this might taste like in your head. And I didn't expect this much to turn out, so I brought, I, I brought out only seven. So if you could take just one, 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 one. I think it's a remarkable thing to encourage an undergrad to apply to grad school. Because they're thinking this is what grad school's like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> setting, setting up, fancy yeah, setting a, yeah, yeah, raising a bar high, raising a bar high, yeah. <laughs> And there you go. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that, Rob. <laughs> if you could maybe uh, uh, break in half so that you could um, uh, share as well between them. And then before you eat, please, ima please imagine in your head what that will taste like. What kind of chocolate it is. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's, uh, yeah, yeah. What does it, what does it taste like? Yeah, imagine, imagine in your head, in, imagine in your cognition what that will taste like. And see if your bodily gain is different. I'm trying to teach my son how to eat fish now. But, uh, yeah. Is it different or same? Different. Oh. And I come to think of why, why are we not using experiencing more in psychotherapy? Right? Um, sometimes talking is one thing and experiencing is uh, another thing, you know? Oh, that's a wonderful professor, Robinder Bedi. Wow. You hear a lot about it, but have you had the actual taste of that lecture? Maybe different or maybe same as well. You never know what it tastes, what something tastes until you eat them. So, give it a try. So this is um, a sequence of change that I worked on, according to Morita, and uh, I'm, I'm pigeonholing here, but just for the sake of contrasting. Traditionally, in conventional approaches, we have lots of uh, therapeutic interventions to try to teach and coach client to control, fight, or manage symptomatology and then desired feeling is acquired change the way you think change the way you feel now you can do something and live your life so uh, in monitor therapy we try to assist clients and patients to take what it is think about what may they may be able to do will bring a new experience and then this is the agent that changes them to give oh, sorry this is the mechanisms that gives them the desired feeling, not our words, but their bodily gain into it. So we value time between session, client's favorite activity, therapeutic relationship and dialogue, what it tastes like to have a conversation with Morita therapists. We value patient and client's life. And if clients talk only about their wonderful escape to Whistler within uh, 50 minutes of a session, we take it as a sign that they don't need more therapy anymore. 
Why? Because they are not fixated anymore and preoccupied. And so if they're uh, focused on, that's an extreme example. But uh, looking at the clients who always talk from the beginning to the end about his or her or their anxiety, not talking at all, but talking about skiing in Whistler, let's say. I, I think this is so wonderful. And I'm just thinking about my work, especially with couples. Mm. And, you know, going with this conventional, like, steps or model, I'm not too sure what mm. to call it, but wanting to, wanting to just quickly jump to, because what can we do to get the desired feeling? But then if I'm taking them through this first place of control fight, then I'm getting very discouraged. Mm. And then some just withdrawing from it. Oh, it doesn't work. Yeah. Your session is not working. Mm. Right? But mm. I really like yeah. this, this topic. Mm. I mean, you raise up a lot of good points. And we never get to learn about those failed cases, do we? Mm. Yeah. Mm. That's a, a shame. But uh, yeah, absolutely. And sometimes I'm... Um, Something my hate is that I feel like a cheap salesman. I'm the, of course, these uh, interventions is depending on your formulation, right? In assessment, you learn can you formulate this client's issue? Could we bring in theory to understand, including psychopathology, what's the issue that this person is dealing with? And then you custom design the psychotherapeutic approach and intervention. So I'm advocating integrative approach. But I feel for someone who is always have to advocate uh, things like cognitive behavioral therapy um, because of protocolized delivery or something they can't breach and say they have to force this cognitive restructuring and sometimes you feel like a cheap salesman selling <laughs> change the way you think, change the way you th feel and client is resistant and they can't even utter a word of empathy or transparency or immediacy and saying, well, sounds like we have bumped into the hurdle. Can't even say that. Uh, but the process work is very important. Yeah. Uh, we are finished with the mechanisms of change. I'm just going to share with you forms of monitor therapy and a couple of resources and we'll call it a day. Uh, evolution of monitor therapy. Uh, Morita's original method is inpatient and residential. There are four stages and it's completely done speechlessly. So no using awards. So it's, it's an interesting uh, thing. I brought uh, his literature and I'll, as a present to Rob. And if you want to borrow it, uh, you can uh, sign off uh, with uh, uh, Rob uh, as well, but um, he describes his original methods in uh, his original book as well. And the uh, guideline for practicing uh, multi therapy, I'll leave this with Rob as well. So, uh, original is inpatient residential. You live in Morita's home. So, he opened um, uh, Morita's uh, own home uh, with support of his wife then uh, to take in patients as well. We took principal out so that they could do an outpatient basis. So that's the, we just developed the guideline in 2010. So this is a guideline. I'll leave this with Rob if you want to take out. Articulates principles, how to translate into interventions. So we have a principal application available to outpatient form. Application of principle to counseling context using empathy and alliance work uh, issue. Uh, again, UBC uh, with us. Um, uh, uh, he just retired. Uh, he has a book, Active Counseling Methods. Uh, unfortunately, it's only available in Japanese, but he has a collection of articles on Morita that covers all of them. So. If you're interested, you could harass him in his email and say, I'm very interested in learning. He's a, he's a lovely, generous gentleman. He will send you a package immediately. Uh, you get a reply 100 out of 100. So um, yeah, he's, he's a wonderful being. So uh, you can inquire or learn. Can you share your uh, writing? And I do have, uh, I do wrote, uh, write, um, I did write a treatment protocol when we are doing the uh, RCT in the UK and uh, Japanese Society for Morit Therapy. We are doing a RCT on Morit Therapy for Anxiety uh, with sample size of 140. 
and I wrote a, a protocol uh, for that. Not going to bother about range of applicability. You have that as a slide. A little bit of uh, further information if you're interested, because this is very, very inaccessible uh, therapy. I, I get asked, an issue got asked, uh, where, I, where do I get proper training and certification? More seminars as well. Uh, long years, uh, we, were, uh, uh, we didn't have any structure, and that's actually not fair, because someone who wants to access can't access, so uh, we are working on that, and I've worked on that. But uh, anyways, here's an opportunity that is upcoming. We have an International Congress of Morita Therapy in Vancouver. In September 1st and 2nd, there's a website. You could have a look at it. I just happen to be the chair of the Congress. Uh, I will have a student uh, rate for pre-Congress seminars and uh, uh, Congress, which is about $180, uh, which is for two days, uh, which is available. Pre-Congress promotional seminar, we are putting that on as well on the 30th. Uh, we will have lots of monitor therapists coming from around the world as well. So we decided, hey, let's, um, let's offer some promotional seminar. And if you're interested, uh, give me an email. I'll, I'll be happy to send you uh, uh, information. And I do a training seminars and clinical supervision group. Uh, uh, that's my... Uh, uh, set up CCMT. Uh, if you're interested in further pursuing uh, uh, level one and two, three and four certification, let me know as my contact address. We do have international committee for Morita therapy and Japanese society for Morita therapy. We, we, we would like to say that we're just lovely, friendly people who is always welcome uh, for new members to come and uh, taste Morita therapy. Everybody welcome. Uh, uh, and uh, to join us to learn about Morita therapy. And we have an annual domestic conference uh, uh, for Japanese Society for Morita therapy this year in Tokyo, uh, GK University School of Medicine, where Morita himself is uh, uh, Professor Emeritus as well. In Tokyo, as you know, always a fun uh, place to go and visit. That's about what I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Uh, any comments or questions, or I guess we should wrap up. Or uh, can you distinguish uh, willful from purposeful? Hmm. Mm, yeah. One was with action, and the other is without action. Probably. Yeah. Purposeful is maybe doable. Yeah. Uh, willful is that without moving you could do it. You could try to do it, I guess. That's, that's, that's what came to my mind. Yeah. Do you, do you, your idea, maybe? Uh, no, I was, I was just curious about the conception of will. I think with any hmm? monistic uh, yeah. uh, theoretical conception, I'm like, very fascinated by the conception of will. Cause mm, usually yeah. I associate monism with yeah. Um, predestination. Yeah. Um, but I saw enough within, within this presentation that I can see that Meaning, purpose still plays a large mm. role. Mm. Uh, interpretation, while uh, it can maybe be one of those things that mm. uh, is not grounded in, in reality, mm. it's still something that shapes how we make decisions in our lives. Mm. Um, mm. So, no, I was just curious to have your interpretation. Of that. Yeah, that sounds like a rich question to pursue as well. Sounds like there's more to it. You know, you're right, in ex existential realms, we talk about purpose, we talk about will. Agency, authenticity, that kind of things. Yeah. I don't think there's a straightforward, simple answers, but rather to entertain the yeah. ri richness of the question, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling more. I'm excited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A enticing dialogue. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And so I'm wondering if there's overlap in that sense, like if you know if if you've identified or overlap with other cultures, especially mm. African, East African mm. ways of thinking. And mm. Well, thanks for the question. 
uh, I've been to Kampala before. Oh, cool. Yeah, I, my favorite drink was Waragi. Yeah. But uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, I have a research project in Rwanda oh, cool. applying Morita idea to reconciliation yeah. uh, because um, uh, by then uh, they had a forgiveness-based reconciliation, mm -hmm. but problems that people can't forgive. Sure. And uh, we force reconciliation sometimes. Mm -hmm. So my approach, other one, is uh, no, 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 no. Leave unforgiveness aruga mama. Yeah. Can we look for something that they may be able to do together? Mm -hmm. So get perpetrator to work for genocide survivor. And we, we follow the change yeah. of that yeah. instead of asking, would you forgive me? Would you let me work for you? Would you receive? So that seems to take off. I work with uh, two bishop in there, critiquing forgiveness. <laughs> but uh, they do reach forgiveness. But um, um, uh, 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 actions speak louder than words, purposeful mm -hmm. action. There's a lot of uh, micro uh, uh, ideas that I found applicable to Rwanda and Burundi and Uganda. Yeah. Yeah. I'm generalizing, but right. yeah. Right. Yeah. How do you know Waraji? Mm -hmm. How do I know it? Waraji, yeah. Oh, just growing up, seeing the bottle. <laughs> I see. Yeah, it's a, a local gin. Yeah. Delicious. <laughs> yeah, it does taste like gin. Yeah. 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 Well, Eva, thank you for your time coming here, and thank you, Rob, for inviting me again, once again. Thanks for your time. I said he's a true leader in the field, so I'm happy to have him teach about marina therapy and not, not me. So, really so thank you so much, Mas, for thank you. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm.